Hello! In this video, we are going to prove some of the basic properties of complex numbers. So let's start out with the following definition. Let z equal a plus bi be a complex number. We define the absolute value of z to be the square root of a squared plus b squared. Now, we have another definition for absolute value, and that involves the absolute value of a real number, which is as follows. Let r be a real number. We define the absolute value of r to be r if r is greater than or equal to 0, and negative r if r is less than 0. Now, to distinguish between these two definitions for now, let's write absolute value in the complex sense and absolute value in the real sense, just to distinguish between them. But the claim is, we don't have to distinguish between these two definitions. In other words, we claim for every real number r, the absolute value of r in the real sense is equal to absolute value of r in the complex sense. If we can prove this, then this means we don't have to distinguish our notation here. And I'll explain why after we prove this. But in any case, how do we prove this? Well, we're going to use the following fact in our proof. For every real number x, the square root of x squared is equal to absolute value of x in the real sense. Right? And that makes sense, because if we consider an arbitrary real number x, if x is greater than or equal to 0, well, when we take the square root of x squared, it's going to have to be equal to x, because x is the real number greater than or equal to 0, such that if we raise it to the power 2, we get x squared. Therefore, the square root of x squared must be equal to x. On the other hand, if x is less than 0, then the square root of x squared must be equal to negative x, because in this case, the negative x will be greater than 0. And if we do negative x squared, we get x squared. So, square root of x squared must be equal to negative x. Now, if x is greater than or equal to 0, x is the absolute value of x. If x is less than 0, the negative x is absolute value of x. So that's essentially why this is true. But in any case, we're going to use this fact to prove our claim. So how do we prove our claim? Well, since we're trying to prove a statement about every real number, let's give ourselves an arbitrary real number. From here, we want to prove absolute value of r in the real sense is equal to absolute value of r in the complex sense. Now. We can think of r as a complex number. r is just r plus 0i. And with this, we can apply the definition of complex absolute value, right? Absolute value of r in the complex sense is just the square root of r squared plus 0 squared. But then, r squared plus 0 squared is just r squared. And by our preliminary result, the square root of r squared is absolute value of r in the real sense. So we have shown that absolute value of r in the real sense is equal to absolute value of r in the complex sense, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So this proves our claim. So then, how does this imply that we don't have to distinguish between our notation? Well, if we consider any complex number w, and we want to speak of the absolute value of w. Well, first of all, if w is not a real number, then we could only possibly be referring to this definition. On the other hand, if w is a real number, then we could be referring to this definition or this definition. So then, which definition are we referring to? Well, it doesn't matter which definition we're referring to, because both values from the definitions are equal. So, I don't have to specify whether or not this is absolute value of r in the real sense or absolute value of r in the complex sense, because no matter which one it is, they're both equal. So I might as well just say the absolute value of w rather than absolute value of w in the real sense or complex sense. So, we don't have to distinguish our notation here. They yield the same value anyways. And so, yeah. Next, we have another definition. 
let z equal a plus bi be a complex number. We define the conjugate of z, or z bar, to be a minus bi. So really you just switch the plus sign to a minus sign. And that is it. So now, the claim is the following. Let z be a complex number. Then, z times z bar is an element of the real numbers which are greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, the absolute value of z is equal to the square root of z times z bar. Okay, so let's prove this. So first, we're going to say that the complex number z that we're working with is z equals a plus bi. And now, we're first going to show that z times z bar is an element of the real numbers which are greater than or equal to zero. Now, first of all, by definition of the complex conjugate, since z equals a plus bi, z bar is equal to a minus bi. So now let's compute z times z bar and show that it's a real number greater than or equal to zero. Now, performing z times z bar, we're really just performing a plus bi times a minus bi. And so expanding this out, we're going to get a squared minus a bi plus a bi minus b squared i squared. Now, the two guys in the middle cancel out and i squared is equal to negative 1. So negative b squared times negative 1 gives us plus b squared. Therefore, this entire thing just simplifies down to a squared plus b squared. And then, if we recall, for any real number x, x squared is greater than or equal to 0. So in particular, a squared is greater than or equal to 0, and b squared is greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, their sum is greater than or equal to 0. So this is an element of the real numbers greater than or equal to 0. And so, we have shown that z times z bar is an element of the real numbers greater than or equal to 0. And now, because we've shown z times z bar is equal to a squared plus b squared, it's not difficult to show that this is true, right? By definition of absolute value, we know that the absolute value z is square root of a squared plus b squared. But we've just shown that a squared plus b squared is equal to z times z bar, so we could replace a squared plus b squared with z times z bar. And so, that is exactly what we wanted to show. So this completes the proof. Here's the next claim we're going to prove. For all complex numbers z, the conjugate of the conjugate of z is equal to z. Okay, so let's prove this. Since we're trying to prove a state about every complex number, let's give ourselves an arbitrary complex number. We'll call it z equals a plus bi. So then, by definition of complex conjugate, we know that z bar is equal to a minus bi. But I'm actually going to rewrite this as a plus the negative of b times i, because now we're going to apply the definition of complex conjugate again, right? By definition of the complex conjugate, what is z bar bar? All we got to do is switch the plus sign to a minus sign. So z bar bar is a minus the negative of b times i. Right? But then the two negatives cancel out. This is just left with a plus bi, right? And that's equal to z. So we get z bar bar is equal to z, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. So this completes the proof. From here, we can actually use these two facts to prove the following claim. For all complex numbers z, the absolute value of z is equal to absolute value of z bar. Now, you could prove this by giving yourself an arbitrary complex number z equals a plus bi. Well, in that case, z bar is equal to a minus bi. And so absolute value of z is just square root of a squared plus b squared. 
absolute value of the z bar is square root of a squared plus the negative v squared, and those two are clearly equal. But instead, we're going to actually use these two results to prove this. So to start out the proof, let's give ourselves an arbitrary complex number z. Notice I'm not expressing it into um, real and imaginary components because we're not going to need it. Now we're going to show that absolute value of z squared is equal to absolute value of z conjugate squared. So what is absolute value of z squared? Well, going to the fact we prove here, if we square both sides, we get absolute value of z squared equals z times z bar. But by the second fact we proved, we know that z is equal to z bar bar. Next, I'm actually going to swap these two around. But then we just apply the first fact again, right? z bar times z bar bar is really just equal to absolute value of z bar squared. Because all we're doing is we're taking z to be z bar. Well, then z becomes z bar, z bar becomes z bar bar. Square both sides, you get this. And so we have shown that absolute value of z squared is equal to absolute value of z bar squared. Well, it follows that the square root of these two guys must be equal. So in other words, absolute value of z is equal to absolute value of z bar. And so this completes the proof. Okay, now the next fact that we're gonna prove is kind of obvious, but here it is. Let z be a complex number. If z is equal to zero, then the absolute value of z is equal to zero. If z is not equal to zero, then absolute value of z is greater than zero. Okay, so let's prove this. Okay, so to start with the proof, we're gonna prove one. And so let's suppose z is a complex number equal to zero. Well then, as a complex number, we could think of this as zero plus zero i. And so applying the definition of absolute value, we get absolute value z is equal to square root of zero squared plus zero squared. That's just zero. Square root of zero is zero. So absolute value z is zero. So this proves one, now let's prove two. So to prove two, we're supposing z is not equal to zero. And to prove this, let's suppose that z is written in the form a plus bi. Now, since z is not equal to zero, it cannot be the case that both a and b are equal to zero. So we must instead have either a is not equal to zero or b is not equal to zero. In either case, we're going to show that the absolute value of z is greater than zero. So let's start with case one where a is not equal to zero. Well then, a squared is greater than zero. Right, this is a property of real numbers. For all non-zero real numbers x, x squared is greater than zero. So we're just applying that here. Well then it follows, if we add b squared on both sides, we get a squared plus b squared is greater than b squared. And b squared is greater than or equal to zero because for every real number x, x squared is greater than or equal to zero. Right? But then a squared plus b squared by definition is the absolute value of z squared. Right? Because by definition, absolute value of z is square root of a squared plus b squared. So if we square both sides, we get this. So absolute value of z squared is strictly greater than zero. And since the absolute value of z squared is strictly greater than zero, the square root of absolute value z squared must be strictly greater than zero. So this completes the case where a is not equal to zero. Now let's consider the case where b is not equal to zero. In this case, you're gonna get a similar argument. Since b is not equal to zero, b squared must be strictly greater than zero. So now we add a squared to both sides. We get a squared plus b squared is strictly bigger than a squared. And we know a squared is greater than or equal to zero because any real number squared is greater than or equal to zero. 
by definition, a squared plus b squared is equal to absolute value of z squared. So this shows that absolute value of z squared is strictly greater than zero. And since absolute value of z squared is strictly greater than zero, when we take the square root of it, the square root must also be strictly greater than zero. Therefore, absolute value of z is strictly greater than zero. So in either case, we have that absolute value of z is greater than zero, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So this completes the proof. Next, we're going to prove facts regarding the real part and imaginary parts of a complex number. Let z be a complex number, then the real part of z is equal to z plus z bar over 2, and the imaginary part of z is equal to z minus z bar over 2i. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, let's just give ourselves a complex number z equals a plus bi. Now, in this case, we know that z bar is equal to a minus bi, the real part of z is a, and the imaginary part of z is b. So first we're going to show if we simplify this expression, it reduces down to a, and then we're going to show if we simplify this expression, it reduces down to b. So let's start out by simplifying this expression down to a. So. What can we say? Well, we know that z is equal to a plus bi, and z bar is equal to a minus bi, so we can just perform those two substitutions. Now, we could immediately see that the numerator simplifies down to 2a, but just to really emphasize that, I'm going to group together the real parts, a plus a, and the imaginary parts, bi minus bi. And so now, I'm just going to say this simplifies down to 2a, so we get 2a over 2, and that's just equal to a. So this expression simplifies down to a, which we know is equal to the real part of z. And so we have shown that the real part of z is equal to z plus z bar over two. So that proves this. Now we're gonna prove this, right? We're gonna show that z minus z bar over two i simplifies down to b. So again, we're going to substitute z for a plus b i and z bar for a minus bi. And so, again, I'm going to group together the real and imaginary parts. We see that we have a minus a plus bi plus bi, because the two negatives join together to make a positive. And now we see that this is just going to simplify down to 2bi. And so we see 2i over 2i cancels out. We're just left with b. Right? and b is equal to the imaginary part of z. So we have shown that the imaginary part of z is equal to z minus z bar over 2i, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So this completes the proof. Okay, so now we're going to prove the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division rule for complex conjugate. For all complex numbers z and w, z plus w bar is equal to z bar plus w bar, z minus w bar is equal to z bar minus w bar, z times w bar is equal to z bar times w bar, and if w is not equal to zero, then z over w bar is equal to z bar over w bar. Okay, so let's start out by proving one. Well, first of all, let's give ourselves two arbitrary complex numbers z and w, we'll say z is equal to a plus bi, and w is equal to c plus di. And I would first like to note that z bar is going to be equal to a minus bi, and w bar is going to be equal to c minus di. Okay, so now let's proceed to prove 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let's first prove 1. Now for one, well, what is z plus w? If we compute z plus w, we're really just adding a plus bi and c plus di. 
if we group together the real parts and the imaginary parts, we get a plus c plus b plus d i. And now we can observe that the conjugate of z plus w is just going to be switching the plus sign to a minus sign. And now we're going to show that this simplifies down to z bar plus w bar. Notice if we just drop the parentheses, we get a plus c. Distributing minus i across, we're going to get minus bi minus di. And now we can group together a minus bi plus c minus di. Just like that. But then we know that a minus bi is equal to z bar and c minus di is equal to w bar. So we have shown that z plus w bar is equal to z bar plus w bar, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So this proves one. Now let's prove two. To prove two, well, first of all, what is z minus w? Here, we're just gonna substitute z for a plus bi and w for c plus di. And next, let's just drop the parentheses, distribute the minus sign across. And now let's group together the real parts and the imaginary parts. Grouping together the real parts, we have a minus c. And grouping together the imaginary parts, we have plus b minus di. So just like that. Okay, so z minus w is precisely this. And so if we consider what z minus w bar is, all we're doing is switching the plus sign to a minus sign. And now we're going to show that this reduces down to z bar minus w bar. Well, first let's just drop the parentheses. So we have a minus c. And then distributing minus i across, we're going to get minus bi plus di. Right? And then notice we have a minus bi. I'm just going to swap these two middle terms around. So we get a minus bi minus c plus di. Because now I'm just going to put parentheses around a minus bi. But then for the last two terms, we can factor out a minus sign. So inside, we're going to get c minus di. Right? So that is really just equal to this. But then we know a minus bi is z bar and c minus di is w bar. And so we have shown that z minus w bar is equal to z bar minus w bar, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So this proves two. Now let's prove three. To prove three, well, first of all, what is z times w? Well, if we compute z times w, we're really just doing a plus bi times c plus di. So expanding this out, we're going to get ac plus adi plus bci plus bdi squared. But what's i squared? i squared is just negative 1. So really, this last term is really just minus bd. And then we can group together the real parts and the imaginary parts. So grouping together the real parts, we have ac minus bd. Grouping together the imaginary parts, we just have ad plus bci. And now we know what the conjugate of zw is. We just switch the plus sign to a minus sign. So just like that. But now we want to show that zw bar is equal to z bar times w bar. And what we're going to actually do is we're going to start with z bar times w bar. And we're going to show that this guy is equal to this. So what is z bar times w bar? That's just going to be a minus bi times c minus di. And now expanding this out, we're going to get ac minus adi minus bci plus bdi squared. But again, i squared is just equal to negative 1, so this last term is just minus bd. So now we can group together the real components, so ac minus bd. 
and then we can group together the imaginary components, we can just factor out a minus i, and we're left with ad plus bc. Right? And that is precisely equal to z times w bar. So we have shown that z times w bar is equal to z bar times w bar, which is exactly what we wanted. So this proves 3. So now we're going to prove 4. We have a condition for number 4, and it's that w is not equal to 0. And this condition makes sense, because since w is not equal to 0, we're able to divide by w. So the complex number z divided by w makes sense. But then, how do we know the right-hand expression makes sense? Well, since w is not equal to 0, we know that the absolute value of w is greater than 0. But the absolute value of w is equal to the absolute value of w bar, so that implies absolute value of w bar is greater than 0. Therefore, it cannot be the case that w bar is equal to 0, because if w bar was equal to 0, then the absolute value of w bar would be equal to 0, which contradicts the fact that absolute value of w bar is greater than 0. Therefore, w bar must be not equal to 0, so we can divide by w bar. So the right-hand expression makes sense as well. So the point is, since w is not equal to 0, we can make sense out of these two expressions. So it makes sense to ask ourselves whether or not these two expressions are equal to each other. And so now we're going to prove that. So let's suppose that w is not equal to 0. And now we're going to show, well, first of all, what is z divided by w? Well, we replace z with, sorry, we'll replace z with a plus bi and w with c plus di. Okay, but then we're going to write this in the form a plus bi. Right, we're going to re-express this in this form. And to do that, all we have to do is multiply both the numerator and denominator by c minus di. Okay, so then what happens if we do this? Well, in the denominator, if you multiply c plus di times c minus di, you're going to be left with c squared plus d squared. While in the numerator, if we expand this out, we're going to be left with ac minus adi plus bci minus bdi squared. But i squared is just equal to negative 1, so the last term is really just plus bd. So now in the numerator, if we just group together the real and imaginary parts, we're going to group together ac plus bd. And as for the imaginary parts, we have bc minus adi. So then, we can rewrite this as this guy over c squared plus d squared plus this guy over c squared plus d squared. So, we have re-expressed z over w in the form a plus bi. Just this, right? So now, what is the conjugate of z over w? It's really just this with a plus sign switched to a minus sign. So now we want to show that z bar over w bar will simplify down to this. So let's do that. First of all, we'll replace z bar with a minus bi and w bar with c minus di. And now we're going to show that this guy is equal to this. And we can do that by writing this in the form a plus bi. Right, we can do that. So all we gotta do, we're gonna do basically what we did up here. We're going to multiply both the numerator and denominator, in this case, by c plus di. If we do that, well then, again, in the denominator, this will simplify down to c squared plus d squared. In the numerator, we'll just expand that out. We'll get ac plus adi minus bci minus bdi squared. Now, i squared is just equal to negative 1, 
So we know that the last term is really just going to be plus BD. So now if we group together the real and imaginary parts, we'll ask for the real parts, we get AC plus BD. And as for the imaginary parts, notice we have minus BCI plus ADI. I'm going to factor out a minus I. So really, if we do that, well then in the parentheses, we're going to be left with BC minus AD. Right? So if you were to expand all this out, right, if you were to expand the numerator out, it would be left with this. And then we can split this up into two fractions. It's really just going to be this guy over C squared plus D squared minus this guy over C squared plus D squared. So just like that. But then this is precisely what we have here, which is equal to Z over W bar. And so we have shown that Z over W bar is equal to Z bar over W bar, which is exactly what we wanted to show. And so this proves all four things. Now, Fact number one and fact number three could be generalized to any list of complex numbers. So we have the following fact. This, and also fact number two, we get the similar thing for multiplication. Right, so that's what we get, right? You just use induction. Okay, so now let's prove another claim. For all complex numbers z, the absolute value of z is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the real part of z. The same thing will actually be true for the imaginary part of z, but we're just going to prove this one. So, to start out the proof, let's give ourselves an arbitrary complex number z equals a plus bi. From here, we want to prove that the absolute value z is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the real part of z. Now, we're going to show that the square of this is greater than or equal to the square of this, and it follows that this guy is greater than or equal to this guy. Right? So, first of all, we know that the real part of z is a, and the absolute value of z is the square root of a squared plus b squared. Well, then we have that absolute value of z squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. And a squared plus b squared is greater than or equal to a squared. Right? The reason why this is true is because, again, if we recall, for all real numbers x, x squared is greater than or equal to 0. So in particular, we know that b squared is greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, if you add a squared on both sides, you get this inequality. In fact, a squared is equal to the absolute value of a squared, right? This fact holds for all real numbers. So this tells us, well, first of all, we know that a is equal to the real part of z, so I can replace a with the real part of z. So we get this. So we have shown that the absolute value of z squared is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the real part of z squared. And it follows that the square root of this guy must be greater than or equal to the square root of this guy. So that is, we have that the absolute value of z is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the real part of z. And so that is exactly what we wanted to prove. So this completes the proof. Okay, and that's actually as far as I wanted to go for this video. So, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.